Welcome back to Questing Beast, I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at Through Sunken Lands and Other Adventures. This is the deluxe boxed set. Well, it's a slipcase set anyway, as you can see right here. It's got foil printing on the inside, it's very, very nice. Uh, but it's also available in PDF or in print on demand over on Drive Through RPG. I'll put links down in the description as usual. Now, Through Sunken Lands is a kind of spiritual sequel to um, Beyond the Wall and Other Adventures, which is another old school D&D system that I haven't actually looked at yet, but I've heard a lot about. In that system, Beyond the Wall, the idea is that you're replicating the kind of stories you would find in the Earthsea trilogy or in uh, the Pradane Chronicles, where you have a, a young person or a group of people who leave their town or their village and venture out into the wild and have adventures and, and then come back again. Uh, this takes that same basic system used in that book and applies it to more sword and sorcery. So Conan the Barbarian, uh, Elric from the Michael Moorcock stories, and so forth. All right, let's slide it out here and see what we have. So here is our slipcase, same on both sides. And it has kind of a orangish or coppery pr um, foil printing there on the inside. There's our title over there, Through Sunken Lands. Nothing on the back, very minimalist presentation. It's got a ribbon down there. And really nice packaging, really nice construction here. The end papers are textured. The actual paper quality has a slightly cream color to it and it's very opaque, very, very nice. Um, all the binding is stitched. You can see the stitching inside the, the crease there. Really well designed. The printing is really excellent. It's just a very uh, premium product, so it's really nice. It is quite expensive. I looked it up. Someone sent me a copy of this. Um, but as I said, you can get it for much cheaper if you want to go PDF or in print. Before we get into the actual contents, though, a quick shout out to today's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by A Folklore Bestiary, a new compendium of D&D monsters by the creators of Knock Magazine. Now available on Kickstarter. A Folklore Bestiary is a 160-page, full-color hardback with sewn binding, featuring 40 new monsters and 40 full-page illustrations. It features stories, stats, and gameable material for each monster, fleshing them out into more than just an encounter. And it comes in both 5e and old-school versions. I'm a big fan of the Knock magazines, and I'm super excited to see their take on a monster manual. Check it out on Kickstarter using the link in the description. All right, here's our table of contents over here. We have our core rules, how to play, a section on spells and magic, a bestiary, and then a kind of gazetteer of the default setting, which of course you can change quite easily, and scenarios and um, playbooks, which is really interesting. These playbooks are a way to develop characters that have an actual detailed backstory and that have connections to other PCs in the game. It's the same system that was used for Beyond the Wall, or so I've heard. There's uh, these nice big full page illustrations every time you come to a new section of the rules. So the core rules right here. Um, brief introduction to what is um, role playing game, what is sword and sorcery in particular, and what do the numbers mean? So here's your basic stats. It uses the same stats you'd find in most D&D stuff, strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma, ability score, distribution is pretty much what you would expect in terms of the bonuses. Alignment is a bigger deal here. You have the alignments of law and chaos and the neutrality or possibly the balance. And uh, unlike in uh, what you would find in more modern D&D, law and chaos aren't really personality types so much. They can be for sure, um, but they more represent actual allegiances. They represent cosmic forces that your character can be allied with or not allied with. Um, if you're on the side of law, then there are actual beings that will recruit you into uh, to try and accomplish law's goals in the universe. And that can be good or it can be bad because law and chaos do not necessarily map onto good and evil. All of the basic rules for the system are very similar to old school D&D or BX D&D. Uh, not a lot of big changes there. There's some changes in magic, which we will get to in a little bit. There are fortune points. So you do have these, uh, just a couple of these meta currency points that you can use to spend um, to improve your roles or really to re-roll certain um, roles that fail if you want to get a second chance at it. You only have a couple of them though, so it's not going to make a huge difference in the game and they only refresh at the start of a new adventure. There's some brief rules here for making a character if you don't want to use the more detailed um, playbooks at the back, which are a bit like life path generators in some ways. Um, you just assign your ability scores, roll 46, you don't have the lowest one, so then you get six numbers and you arrange them however you want. There are skills here. These skills are all free form and they basically give you plus two in one particular area. It could be cooking, forgotten lore, stealth, tracking. You can make up whatever you want as long as the DM approves. 
Um, you can also put both of your starting skills into the same skill to get a plus four instead. The default assumption here is that you start on second level instead of on first level because you are just a tougher character. You don't start out as just a lantern carrying nobody. You are a bit tougher, you're a bit more experienced, and you're more um, capable of going out and being a adventuring hero. Here's our three basic classes. We've got warrior, hit dice d10, initiative bonus plus one. Uh, basically your initiative um, thing is a little bit interesting. So it's represented by your level and sometimes you get a bonus to it and it's just a static number. And then when you have an actual combat, you just go in initiative order by just looking at everyone's initiative number. You don't actually roll it. Um, warriors get some special bonuses. Your attack bonus goes up faster. Um, your weapon specializations, you're better at fighting with a particular weapon. And there's some knacks that you can pick up at certain levels, like being a defensive fighter, or, uh, being faster or getting a great strike, things like that. You can also be a rogue or a mage, just three basic classes, your standard fantasy archetypes. Um, each of those has little special abilities that make it a little bit, um, that, that are more appropriate for that particular class. So for example, rogues are a little bit faster, have higher initiative. They have fortune's favor. They have luck beyond that of other men. They have more uh, fortune points than other people and they get extra skills and mages of course get spell casting. Short section on coin and its uses, prices for things, character traits. So these are things that you can add if you want. Um, so you can start uh, off with a trait if the game master permits it and says each character should receive a further trait at levels five and nine, representing the, representing the character's growth and acquisition of new abilities. And there's quite a lot of these. You've got general traits, alignment traits. So these would depend on the particular alignment that your character is. Combat traits, you get better at fighting, some spellcasting traits, some supernatural traits. The cosmic struggle goes a little bit more into pledging allegiance to the different cosmic powers of law or of chaos and what might happen if you change allegiance. Not good. You'll get cursed in some way by one of the two sides. Uh, we have hirelings and allies right near the beginning of the book. That's kind of interesting. A lot of books kind of put this in an appendix at the back, but having hirelings and allies and recruiting people to help you is a big part of the game. It has their cost um, here and it's limited by your charisma is going to affect how many of them you can have at any particular time. Allies are stronger uh, followers, are basically more like powerful NPCs. They're more likely to actually have levels and things like that. Rolling the dice, so the assumption here is that when you do an ability score check, like doing a dexterity check to see if you're fast enough to do something, you're rolling a d20 underneath your ability score. So you're trying to roll low in that sense. Whereas most of the other rolls, like for saving throws or for attacks, you're trying to roll high with a d20. This isn't too um, dissimilar to what is recommended in BX D&D. Some rules for combat, as I said, initiative just goes um, in the initiative order of the number that the character has. And attacking enemy, it's standard D&D. Um, you're attacking by rolling D20, trying to hit their armor class. You have your normal damage rolling. Healing and, re and recovery is very slow. So you're gonna be recovering basically one hit point per day, which is in line with what we see in like advanced D&D. So you're gonna have a lot of downtime um, that you're gonna be recovering. Maybe that's an opportunity to have more than one character. So one is healing while your other character is doing something, or perhaps you could develop downtime activities. I thought this was really interesting. Right near the beginning of the book, there was a whole section on war and battle, which is usually kind of a vestigial depreciated system that's in the back of the book, maybe, but here it's front and center with the assumption being, I suppose, that you're gonna be having wars and battles that your characters are going to be leading. Uh, the basic rules here are the, is that there's three phases. So you have the preparation phase, the battle itself, and then the aftermath. In the preparation phase, your character is going to be trying to do stuff to help your side win before things actually begin. So you could be scouting things out, and you could be giving an inspiring speech to your troops. And then depending on how well these roles do, you're going to get these modifiers that are going to affect the tide of battle, which is this bonus or penalty that you're trying to get as high as possible before the battle actually starts. Other uh, bonuses that you could get include from how good your uh, troops are, how many you have, right? If you have lots of elite troops, that's going to help you out. And the lay of the land, depending on where you're attacking and the situation, that can give you an advantage as well. Once you've actually figured out this tide of battle number, you're going to make the actual battle roll, presuming that you are the general of your army. You're going to make a... Uh, intelligence check or a wisdom check or a charisma check, and you're going to be able to use the tide of battle bonus to help you out doing that. And hopefully you want it to succeed by as much as possible. After you make the battle roll though, each PC can take part in one vignette inside the battle where they leap in and risk themselves in some way in order to try and get that result even higher. So this could be you jumping in and fighting a powerful enemy or even just trying to battle your way through ranks of enemy soldiers or, or something else that you think is appropriate for the situation. 
once that's all finished, you combine the battle roll that you made and the efforts of the PCs from the scenes. Hopefully you got some more bonuses from that. And you look at your total results. You want to succeed at your check by as much as possible. For example, if you succeeded at your check by 10 or more, you're going to get three successes, which we'll look at in just a second. If you lose by 10 or more, it's three failures. In between there, it's a mix of the two. Now, keep in mind that both of the generals are making this roll, you and the enemy NPC. So it's possible that you both succeed at your checks really well, and you both get three successes, or maybe you both get three failures. More likely, it's going to get a mix of the two for both sides. You're going to turn to this table right here, and you're going to see how many successes and how many failures you got, and you're going to take turns picking one at a time. So if you got, say, two successes and one failure, you could start out by saying, okay, I'm going to start off by just picking a failure. Like, I take damage. One of my units has been destroyed. And then the enemy goes. They say, well, I'm going to use one of my successes. And I'm going to say, I took some of your hostages. Then you can go back and say, well, I'm going to use one of my successes, one of my successes and uh, pick rescue. So I'm going to take those hostages back. And so by spending these successes and failures, you can tell this narrative of how the battle actually went. It's a very fun idea. I really like it. It's a great way to do things in a bit more abstract of a fashion. There's an abbreviated system for sea travel. It says if you want to get into more detail about actually wave crawling through hexes and so on, you should look at one of their supplements for, uh, one of the supplements that was called Further Afield, and that was for their original system Beyond the Wall, and that has more of their long-distance travel stuff. It's too bad that the system wasn't actually in here, but there is a short abstracted system. Some notes on true names. This reminds me a lot of what we see in Earthsea in Le Guin stories. If you want to have the character's true name be a real part of the experience. Uh, getting into experience and levels right here, you can get experience in lots of different ways. Um, one of the main ways is when you spend gold in a way that does not materially benefit yourself. So wasting it on giant parties and revelry is the best way to get XP. There are some other ways you can kill monsters to get XP and you can accomplish missions and things like that. But as with most old school games, getting gold and then wasting it is the primary way that it's going to work. A section here on the sorceress arts, there's basically three kinds of spells. You got cantrips, you have spells, and you have rituals. Cantrips are you know really fast, cheap little spells um, that you do have to make a skill check to perform, however. And if you fail at them, then you either won't be able to cast any more spells that day or they will go wrong in some way. But in theory, you could keep casting them forever as long as you keep succeeding at the check. Spells are more traditional D&D-like spells. There's a big list of them further on in the book. And basically how those work is you're going to accumulate them in your spell book. As you adventure, you're going to find more and more and write them all down, and hopefully you can understand them. And as you level up, you're going to be able to cast more and more of these. So if you're a level four mage, you can cast four spells per day. That's it. You, you don't have to memorize them. You can just open your spell book and cast four of those spells in any order. Cast the same spell four times, cast four different spells. The spells don't have levels. It's just very straightforward in that sense. Then we have rituals. Rituals do depend a lot more on your level. It's because they're actually leveled from one through 10, because 10 is the highest level that you can get in this game. And you, they take a long time to prepare. Sometimes there's special components that you need, and they're gonna have more powerful effects. We have a section on how to play here. This is basic game mastering advice. What do the players do? How to do class training? Uh, what does the game master do? Uh, they have to make notes, they roll on tables, they guide the players. What do we all do? Just a, a brief primer on role playing for people who might not be too familiar with it. There's a section here on running the game that goes into a bit more detail for game masters. Probably game masters are a little bit more experienced uh, about how you want to keep things moving, develop a thirst for adventure, avoid illusionism in your game mastering. It's really nice to see that called out there. Uh, developing your tone, ancient versus medieval, civilized versus savage, this stuff you would find in sword and sorcery. And we get into our spells and magic section. The cantrip section is pretty short. You got Beast, Ken, Beguilement, Blessing, Conjure Sound, and Glamour Weaving, Hand of Will, Hexing, Mage Light, and Second Sight. Each of these has an ability. That's the ability that you're going to be testing when you cast that cantrip, so that hopefully you can keep casting them. Spells are a bit more um, expansive. They go on for quite a few pages. Probably not as many as in a lot of other D&D um, books, but they cover most of the basics, and they're all... They're non-leveled, right? Like I said, they don't have a particular level to them. So none of them are super powerful. I would say they mostly match up to a lot of the lower level spells that you would find in D&D. Once you want the really powerful stuff, those are all rituals. So your, you know, your 10th level spells in normal D&D would, would be a ritual in here. And all of those have these nice long write-ups because as a ritual, you really want to be able to get into 
uh, the details of what you're doing and what you need and the whole process of it because that makes it feel a lot more immersive and a lot more real. You can do uh, the storms, wrath, contagion, corrosive touch, scrying, resurrection is a level 10 ritual. So that tells you that coming back from the dead, it's probably not going to be as big of a thing in this book as it is in some D&D. A section on magical items, which is uh, perfectly serviceable. The vast majority of these uh, give you just bonuses to one particular ability or to your attack or to your AC, which is a little disappointing. I like stuff that's a little bit less statistics based and just does weird stuff to the world that you have to deal with. Um, but this is perfectly serviceable. Um, some special magical ships that you can acquire. That's really fun. A lot of books don't give you stuff like that. And some specialized artifacts. A bestiary follows with um, your basic chart right here. So here the, here's the hit dice of the monster, and then here's the um, saving throws for them. It follows the standard procedure where um, the hit die of the monster is also the attack roll that you would add to them. So a level 10 or a 10 hit die monster will be rolling plus 10 to do their attacks. This covers all the basics from bats and bears to burrowers, critters, children of chaos, dragons, elementals, all the basic stuff that you would need in a D&D game. The write-ups are terse, they have their stats, they're easy to read, it does what it says that it's going to do. There's an interesting section here on making spirits. So spirits aren't just one type of being in the monster manual, you are encouraged to create your own. There's some basic templates here, but then there's a lot of special abilities that you can easily add on to them, like furious attack or fear, possession, them being spellcasters and so on. I suppose this, this matches up with the type of beings that you would see in the Elric stories, the sort of uh, celestial or infernal powers of law and chaos that your characters might have to be dealing with. Next is Jundar and the Sunken Land. So this is the uh, gazetteer of the world that you're going to be exploring. We have a map of the Sunken Lands over here. Reminds me a lot of the maps that I've seen for Elric's world because you have it mostly in archipelago, so you'll be sailing a lot, but this allows you to have a lot of strange, interesting kingdoms all separated from each other, along with some large kind of terrestrial empires scattered around that you can visit as well. The assumption is that Jundar, which is uh, near the center of the map, is this big metropolis city on this island that all the different nations do uh, trade with. And so everything that you would want is found there. The different peoples, the different uh, magical items, all the different uh, sources of adventure are found in this one giant city. I like the black and white illustrations for the city of Jundar here. It goes into the different uh, districts that you might find. I would like to see a little bit more material for the city in terms of gameable stuff. I, I found this to be often a problem with a lot of gazetteers that I found in many different RPG books describing their settings. They go in, they, into detail about what that place is like, but they don't necessarily give you hooks and gameable material that would help you run the game and give you stuff for the players to interact with, which is what I'm really looking for. Uh, books like World with, Worlds Without Number do that really well. I'd like to see more of that here. Uh, most of the descriptions are perfectly serviceable, but they don't tend to add a whole lot that I wouldn't have been able to come up with on the fly. Now, the playbook section is really interesting because this is one of those unique features of the Beyond the Wall system and through Sunken Lands. And basically, you have you have your, those three standard classes that I showed you at the beginning, right? You have warriors, rogues, and mages. But you can also have these more specific types of classes. For example, the accomplished cell sword was a kind of warrior. But you could have the eldritch sorcerer king, who's a warrior mage. Or perhaps you could have a spell thief that's a rogue mage of the great city, right? So a little bit more... Uh, anchored to this particular setting. And how you make a character using this is that you use these random tables. Your statistics, your main ability scores start out at like eight or 10, but then as you move through each of these questions, not only do you learn more about your backstory, but you actually gain um, abilities like skills and some of your ability scores start going up. So as you make all these choices, that fully fleshes out your character both um, thematically and also mechanically. For example, what did your family do in the city? In the city, your father was a sailor, and you saw him little. How did you distinguish yourself as a child? Um, you enjoyed wandering far on your own. That would give you some wisdom and constitution. How did you spend your mercenary days? You trained with the pikemen who guard the city from invasion and patrol its streets. So you get some sp weapon specializations. You're better at fighting with a spear, more constitution, and more wisdom. What was the greatest battle after leaving the city? Besides the other characters, who was your most valued contact or friend in the city? There's a little bit of adding information to the setting here. So it's not all just being done by the DM. Uh, what happened when you and a friend were hired by a rich man uh, on your return to the city? The player to your right was there with you. So this builds actual bonds between you and other PCs at the table. So when you start the game, you have a shared history built in there. 
and what token you keep for your mercenary days. A little information here on how to fill out the character sheet in the back and a reference page I guess you could copy and uh, just print out for that particular player, along with the you know stats for this particular class. And then it goes through things like the Barbaric Conqueror, Warrior from the Edge of the World. This is your Conan-like character. The Cosmic Champion, and that's a little bit like Elric. The Eldritch Sorcerer King, I guess that's also a little bit like Elric. The High Kabbalist, if you wanna be a strange mage. The Licensed Rogue. Each of these gets one of these little playbooks. So you could really have a session zero where you spend time together rolling this stuff up, making your characters and developing your backstory. And that's a bit different than standard old, old school D&D where you are um, just thrown into the game with very weak characters. And then the maybe the first couple sessions are your backstory. This one, you are a little bit more um, integrated into the world from the beginning. After all the playbooks, we start getting into these scenario packs, which are ways to quickly roll up adventures that can get you running um, right away. So for example, this one is a, that takes place inside the great city itself. There's some generators here for generating street names and character names if you need that. And then as the players are creating their characters, you as the game master can be rolling on these tables and quickly rolling up an adventure. So where's the treasure being hidden or housed? One of the city's many temples to a minor deity. What connects the characters to the treasure? Some advice on how to fill in this table. Why can't this wait? Why must the characters seek the treasure now? A great lord of the city is making the PCs an offer they can't refuse. Handle the situation or die. What to do? Uh, some events during the game. How to actually generate the treasure and what it is, where it came from. A dungeon that you might find in here. It doesn't actually lay out the dungeon to give you a picture of it. It's a little bit more abstract. Um, but what protects the dungeon? What riddles, traps, and dark magic await down there? One thing I did think was interesting is that this book, despite having these fairly detailed rules for like uh, warfare, it doesn't have any dungeon crawling rules like keeping track of uh, torches and uh, uh, turns when you're dungeon crawling and random encounters and things like that, that seems to be not as big of a deal. I suppose you're mostly traveling in the overworld in Through Sunken Lands. Maybe that's the general idea. This adventure pack includes things like recent events, what rumor about the treasure made its way to you, so players have a reason to go on that uh, adventure, and a bunch of suggested monsters that fit in with it. So during that session zero, you can quickly roll up a adventure and it's a very low stress way to feel like you are pretty prepared for jumping into the session. Lastly, we have the bronze appendix, which is a section at the back with a few more character playbooks and scenarios and some more GM advice. Uh, some of these character playbooks and um, scenarios, I feel like could have been integrated into this previous section. Maybe this was originally published separately and they just added it on, I'm not totally sure. Um, but one of the great things about this is that there was a whole section on questions that you can ask PCs even after session zero to continue to flesh out the PCs and get them to talk about themselves more. So for example, perhaps your characters are in the middle of an ocean voyage. You could ask them, who is your greatest rival on the seas? Or what friendly or hostile captain knows you or your vessel by sight? There's a little bit of a dungeon world um, flavor to this where the characters are adding more information to the world and taking on a little bit of the role of the game master. Some players really like that, some players don't. So you have to talk to your players and see uh, what they prefer to do. But not all of it is adding more information to the world. Some of it is just fleshing out their backstory. So um, my character's military exploits. Uh, what horrific war haunts you still? Right, it doesn't necessarily have to be world building. There could have been a war that's already been established, but you can just talk about it. Or their character's religious devotion or their criminal endeavors. Stuff just to make them a bit more detailed. Some of the extra classes include the barbarian beastmaster, who's a warrior slash rogue or the Daring Adventurer, that's a, another warrior rogue. Intrigue in the City, another scenario pack for more shenanigans inside the great city. Lots of stuff here, like what is this uh, at the center of this powerful force in the great city, some key resources, connections to other player characters, events, and so on. We have a character sheets at the very back of the book. We have another replication of that map of the default setting, the Sunken Lands. There we have it through Sunken Lands and other adventures. Put it back in our slipcase right here. So if you're running, if you want to run a Conan-esque type campaign where perhaps you're not doing a lot of dungeon crawling, but you are leading armies, you are finding strange uh, wizard tomes, you're doing rituals and things like that, this is probably a really good choice for that. Um, if you're familiar with D&D, there's very little adaption you need to do. It's gonna work seamlessly with other D&D products. And some of the special features like the war and battle section are really interesting and I like it quite a bit.
This is also a perfect book for people who want more detailed characters, who want fleshed out heroes that are probably gonna survive a bit longer because they start at level two and have a more detailed connection to the other PCs at the table. As usual, links to where you can find this in its deluxe edition and also the PDF and the print on demand versions, all those links will be down in the description below. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you guys next time.